Alright, everyone, welcome back. So, now we're going to start this section titled Mechanical Vibrations. Uh, really what we're trying to do here is first we're going to learn how to combine sinusoids and again sinusoids are, is just a fancy word to encompass both cosines and sines um, and so we're going to be able to see a summation or I guess subtraction if you want to call it that as well of a sine and a cosine and then combine it into just one cosine and then after that we're going to solve the spring mass spring oscillator problem and I should uh, tell you that we're going to solve it for non forcing functions. So it needs to be homogeneous because that's what we just learned in the last section. Great. So to start off, let's learn how to combine sinusoids, right? So let's say a cosine omega t plus b sine omega t. And we want to write this into a form where it's r cosine omega t minus uh, delta, right? So how do we find r omega naught and delta? So, in order to find this, um, let's consider that first the radial frequency omega naught is conserved, right? So, if we're adding sinusoids of the same omega naught, we're going to get at the end of the day is still the same omega naught. So, in our analysis between of here going from here to here, the omega naught is conserved. That's why I wrote it the same way. So, you don't have to worry about solving for it. It's always just the same thing, right? Next, we're going to use the following two uh, systems of equations in order to find our r and our uh, delta. And those are these two as follows. Uh, by the way, if, you, if any of you are right now in EC 2026 at Georgia Tech, um, this should be very uh, straightforward for you. Um, you can use phasor addition, right? Or you can, you know, turn everything into polar and then solve from there. But these two equations are going to help you, are going to allow you to do this for any any other major or any other, if you haven't had signal processing yet or if you're ever going to have it, right? You can do it this way, so don't worry about that. Um, but yeah, just for warning to the people that are in EC or anyone who's taking signal processing, you can go ahead and just use those methods as well. I don't see any TA or professor having an issue with that. So r, you'll notice, if I squared this, I'd get a squared is equal to r squared cosine delta, cosine squared delta, plus, and then I square this one, right, b squared is equal to r squared sine squared delta. Cosine squared plus sine squared is 1, right? So then I have a squared plus b squared is equal to r squared. Therefore, r is just square root of a squared plus b squared. Good. And then if I divide the first and second equations, right, I'll get b over a is equal to r over r is just 1, and then sine over cosine is tangent, so I'll get tangent of delta. Therefore, let's take the arctangent of this, and I'll get delta is equal to arctangent b over a. Uh, something I should warn you about, be careful about this little delta, depending on where you are in the unit circle, right, because this doesn't see if, let's say, b was negative and a is also negative, right? b over a, if those two things are negative, it'll, and you do arctangent, you'll get something that's here, right? Like on the unit circle, you'll get something that's in the first quadrant. But since this was negative, since both were negative, really it should be in the third quadrant. So you'll have to add or subtract by a factor of pi, and this is in radians, right? So just be careful for that. And then finally, when you're analyzing these, uh, more often than not, they're going to ask you about the amplitude, the radial frequency, and the minimal period, and this is what they are. The amplitude is just equal to R, so whenever you find R, that's the amplitude. Radial frequency, I make sure to always, whenever I create a test or uh, I'm teaching, I always say radial, because there's also frequency, right, which is just F, which is in units of hertz, but now we have radial frequency, which we can just pull off the equation, that's great, that's a lot easier, but this is going to be in units of radians per second. So just be careful with that. And then the minimal period, right? The minimal period is going to be given to you in seconds. So you have to get rid of that radian unit in order to get to seconds. So that's going to be t is equal to 2 pi over mega naught. The period could also be 1 over f, which is just the regular frequency, not the radial frequency. And here we didn't have to worry about our units of radians. So again, just be weary of that. Great, let's do a quick problem in order to kind of square all this away. 
So we're given 4 root 3 cosine 2t minus 4 sine 2t. We want to rewrite it as r cosine omega t minus delta, and then determine amplitude, radial frequency, and the minimal period. Good. It shouldn't be too bad. So what we want to do first is, I mean, omega naught is always really easy to pick off, so let's just do that. We notice that it's 2 here and 2 there, right? There's a 2 here and a 2 here. Therefore, omega naught is equal to omega naught, and that is 2 radians per second, right? And then remember, our r is just root a squared plus b squared. So it's going to be square root of 4 root 3 squared plus minus 4 squared. That'll just give you 8, right? And then our delta, right, is going to be given as just the arctangent of b over a. And remember, our b here is defined as our minus 4. And then down here is going to be 4 root 3. Um, this one's actually nice. Uh, if it doesn't come out to be a unit circle value, and by that I mean pi over 6, pi over 2, pi over 3, or you know, you know the you know all the angles, right? Uh, it's okay to leave it like that. Like if it was arc tangent of like e squared or whatever, that's fine. Just leave it as arc tangent of e, e squared. But here it comes out to be nice, and it is negative pi over 6. Cool. So now we want to rewrite this, and that's pretty easy to do, right? We have everything. So y is equal to r, so 8 cosine omega naught, which is 2, times t, minus direct delta. Or, sorry, not direct delta, delta. So minus minus pi over 6 is just plus pi over 6. Be careful about that. And there we go. That's the first part. And then we want to determine the amplitude. So remember I said the amplitude is just r. So amplitude, right, yeah, is 8. Radial frequency is 2 radians per second, right? Which I wrote over there. And then the minimal period, so t is 2 pi over omega naught, which is 2 pi over 2. And so that is pi seconds. And there we go. Simple as that. Now, you may be wondering what this has to do with differential equations, right? Because there was no diff EQ in here. The solution of the mass oscillator question under no damping and no uh, forcing function can be written as r cosine omega naught t minus direct delta. There you go. So, in order to physically understand our solution, it'd be kind of good if we can rewrite it like this, right? At that point, we can tell you the amplitude of the oscillation, uh, the frequency of the oscillation, and kind of how much it's phase shifted, right? That's what this uh, delta is telling you. So we just didn't do this, you know, for shits and giggles. We did this because we actually need it. So stay tuned for that. Cool. All right. So then we have solving the mass oscillator question. Great. So we described it qualitatively before. We discovered how to find the IVP. Now we're going to get down to solving it. And so really, uh, since this is all build up, we just need to use what we've learned so far, right? So all you have to do is follow these four steps. Write down the IVP from the word problem. Find the general solution, which will be from the last video, right? Of It's going to be one of those three cases. Apply your initial conditions, and then if the problem asks you to, write it as r cosine omega naught t minus, direct, uh, minus delta. And they don't have to ask you to do that. Sometimes they'll ask you to find the amplitude, the phase shift, the minimal period, which at that point you have to do that, right? So let's just do a problem, and you'll see what I mean. Cool, okay. So... And if you notice, I've given you this problem before. This is the one that I kind of left off on that video that we didn't know how to do because we didn't know how to solve any of these. Guess what? Now we're going to solve it. I don't like leaving things undone. So, a mass weighing 2 pounds stretches a spring 6 inches. Okay. If the mass is pulled down an additional 3 inches and then released... Ooh, I didn't write an N. Okay, whatever. Excuse my typo. There should be an N over there. Uh, and there is no damping. Determine the position Y of the mass at any time T. Also... Find the radial frequency, minimum period, and amplitude of this motion. Aha, so that's going to imply that we write it as a, uh, you know, combined sinusoid. Okay, cool. So, let's go back to our mass oscillator. 
right? That's written as M. Let me scroll down. I'm going to need more space than that. It's given as M Y prime prime plus gamma Y prime plus K Y is equal to zero, right? Great, so it weighs two pounds. So remember, two is equal to mg. g is equal to 32 feet per second. Therefore, this is two is equal to m times 32. For right now, I don't care about units, so let's just write it like this. So that's m. Gamma, it said no damping, so this is zero. K, remember, in order for this to not be affected by force of gravity, we just assume that the force due to the spring is the same as force of gravity. Therefore, that two pound of uh, gravitational force is actually equal to the spring force, so that's equal to k times however much it's shifted. Remember, shift everything into feet to make your life easy. Six inches over 12 inches. Therefore, k is equal to four, right? And then we want to find our initial conditions, right? Because they're implied here. So pull down an initial three inches. So that means the position at time equals zero and we take down to be positive, right? Three inches over 12 inches is equal to one fourth. And then that word released simply implies zero velocity, right? So great, we have everything. We have, let's see, one sixteenth y prime prime plus four y is equal to zero. And then y of zero is equal to one fourth y prime of zero is equal to zero, cool. Now, let's actually solve this. All right, if we want to solve this, remember, find our characteristic equation. That's just standard. So that's going to be 1 16th lambda squared. So I'm going to move this over here. 1 16th lambda squared plus 4 is equal to 0. Uh, multiplying this through, lambda squared plus 64 is equal to 0. If you can't see the solution here already, let me give you an uh, insider pro tip, I guess. Lambda squared plus a squared is equal to zero. The roots of this is just going to be lambda is equal to plus or minus a i. Okay, so here, lambda is equal to plus or minus eight i. Not a, eight, because we actually have numbers here. So, this is written in the form of, kind of like the last video, alpha plus or minus i beta where alpha is equal to zero and beta is equal to eight, right? So let's write our general solution from here. General solution, y of t, right, is gonna be equal to e to the zero t is just one, right? So we don't need to worry about that. C one cosine of eight t plus C two sine of eight t. Ooh, did not mean that. Let's write a T. Eight T, right? Cool. This should make sense to you, hopefully. If you think about this from a physics standpoint, there's no damping, which means that when we pull down this mass from the spring, it's going to oscillate. And because there's no damping, there's no way for it to go back to its initial rest position. And that can be seen from this equation, right? When you plug in t equals infinity, you're not necessarily guaranteed to get zero, right? Therefore, and if we did have that, right, we would have a damping factor. And at that, that point, you should be able to kind of be able to tell that alpha would have not equaled zero. It would have equaled something negative. Therefore, our alpha and our exponential would have been negative, which meant that the limit as t approaches infinity should have been zero. So remember, we're not just doing differential equations for the sake of, you know, Georgia Tech wants to torture you and get all your tuition money. We're doing this because this is going to be applied later. You can apply this to RLC circuits. You can apply this to actual physical phenomenon. You can apply this to, um, let's see, like heat, heat transfer, fluid dynamics, uh, quantum mechanics. Like, this is everywhere. The, the possibilities are endless. This is why I teach this course. Because I want to I want to be the person that you go through me, I don't want you to ever see a differential equation in your future engineering, math, science, whatever classes, and be intimidated by it. Not only that, I want you to understand what you're doing. So, that aside, um, now what we have to do is apply our initial conditions, right? To remind you, y of zero is equal to one fourth. 
right? And then y prime of 0 is equal to 0. So let's just plug this in. y of 0 is equal to 1 fourth, which means that sine of 0 is just 0. Cosine of 8 times 0 is 1, so that's c1. Great. So 1 fourth, c1. y prime of 0 is equal to 0, which means that, okay, when we take the derivative of this, this cosine is going to become a sine, so that's going to be 0, because when we plug in 0, it's just going to be 0. And then here, we're going to get a plus 8c2, right, because it's going to become a cosine. But it doesn't really matter if I include that 8 or not, because c2 is still 0, right? So great, now our final solution is given as y of t is equal to 1 fourth cosine 8t. And if you're having trouble, uh, like if you're unsure that you got the right answer, make sure it agrees with everything. You can plug this in to your original differential equation, and then make sure that these initial conditions satisfy this, which they should. When you plug in 0 into here, you get 1 fourth, great. When you take the derivative of this and plug in 0, you get 0, great. When you plug this into your differential equation, just in general, you should get 0, and you do. So everything's fine. Um, and then I believe at the very end I asked you to find amplitude, frequency, radial frequency, and period. So amplitude, if you just pick it off the equation right here, amplitude of the motion. This is a sinusoid. It's going to look something like this, right? From here, that's just one fourth. It's whatever's in front of it, right? Uh, let's see, radio frequency, omega naught is just what's ever in front of t, right? So that's eight radians per second. That's how much this is oscillating. And then minimal period t is equal to two pi over omega naught, which is two pi over eight. So pi over four seconds is our period here. And that's it. There you go. You can solve the mass oscillator now for homogeneous cases. And uh, yeah, you're good. So next section, I believe, yes, we're going to move into solving more complicated uh, second order equations, which means we're going to get rid of the whole homogeneous uh, training wheels. And now we're going to get into real differential, well, I shouldn't say real, I should say differential equations that you're more likely to find in the real world. Cool, stay tuned for that.